Sammy, how are you, brother? I'm good, Chris. How are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm all right, mate. Yeah, better every day, to be honest. <laughs> good. Yes. That's what we like to hear. Yes. Well, it's um, it's an absolute honour to finally get to meet, albeit through the the pleasures of Zoom. I think I think Zoom's the bane of everybody's life at at the minute. Well, th this is my second one, so. I don't really know it from the, the point of view of using it. There we go, that's better. So I had the absolute pleasure of I'm trying to think. I was either driving for a podcast with Sean Atwood, or it might have been Jamesy, James English. Yeah. And I was listening to your podcast with one. Of, I've listened to both of them with, with these guys on the way up in the car. Yeah. And I was immediately... Uh, struck sammy not just with your massive experience as a prison officer but also the compassion that you showed um throughout the interview towards the people that were in your charge was um yep. you know it it it, it was re re you know rewarding to to hear that there's people like you out there <laughs> and um i think those of us that grew up with porridge you think of like strange ways prison you think of is it was it fulton Mackay? yeah definitely <laughs> that kind of you know rigid ex-military right you laddie <laughs> um and so yeah so as i said it's an absolute honor to finally get to meet you that's very humbling thank you very much let's talk about that that job then so when was strange ways built for for our Friends listening or American viewers, listeners, Strange Ways is this very antiquated kind of, uh, I'm just going to say it and then Sammy will correct me, like a Victorian. It is a Victorian jail. You know, monstrosity. <laughs> One of those places should probably have been pulled down um, years ago and, and, or at least modernized, but it, it, um, yeah. It was it built. Like Built, I believe, in about 1886 or something like that. Um, there's quite a few of them about, believe it or believe it not. Well, Dartmoor is Dartmoor is a similar sort of construction, is it not? Yeah, you, you know, you've got your, your Bell Marshes, um, Ardmley, Liverpool. There's a lot of really old jails. We're talking to an Irish lad, an Irish prison officer the other day. Uh, he was in a jail in Dublin that was built in 1850 something, you know. So th there's a lot of these these sort of places around, but it's not it's not so much. It's it's not the buildings. Uh, it's another thing that people never understand. You know, if, if a building's that old, it's going to need constantly maintaining. You may get damp, that sort of thing. But when prisoners talk about conditions, it's been locked up. You know, the old days, 23 hours a day. At the minute, during lockdown, 23 and a half hours a day, some of these people have been locked up. Now, that's no fault of the prison service. You know, this virus, you know, it's caused mayhem. And in prison, social distancing and keeping safe and being locked down is being behind your door. Because there's no way... <laughs> Once you, if you open everyone doors that people are going to social distance, you know, they're going to go and talk to the mates and do whatever. So it's very difficult times. Um, but certainly the buildings, yeah, it, it's not about how old they are or it, it's, it's about that being behind your door. The, the prison system itself, it needs a regime. People talk about rehabilitation and things like this, purposeful activity and that. There is none of that. And people get, get really upset, you know. I've had um, quite a few professional people sort of challenge me on the rehabilitation. You know, rehabilitation is what you have when you go to the physio after you've had an operation on your shoulder or something like that. We're not rehabilitating anyone, which doesn't mean that people can't change. There's three lads now that I used to put behind the doors on the healthcare in strange ways who are really good friends of mine. And all three have turned their lives around for different reasons. One, uh, family, you know, first child on the way. So that, that's a game changer and that sort of thing. 
So the prison system as a whole, for me, you know, it's just, it just wants a re revamp, a, a, an overhaul, but it's a massive overhaul. And unfortunately in this country, and like a lot of other places, you don't get leadership. You need someone who's young now, sensible, who's going to be in charge of the prison system for the next 25 years and can follow things through if people want to. You know, myself, for all the will in the world, I, I, I don't think it's going to change. Or The only thing that might change is they might start sending less people to prison. I don't know. Hmm. I find the whole thing quite frustrating. Just one question before I forget to ask you. Did they have a a prison officer's bar in strange ways, like we used to see in the old porridge movie? Um... They did. Not when I was there. Um, I started there in 2005. I, it was, I, I believe it was only a couple of years it had been removed. And again, you know, I fell foul of people. People would be talking about um, the officer's mess with sort of fond regard. So here's how it used to operate. It was open at dinner. People would go in and get pissed and then go back to work. People would come out of work at night and get pissed and drive home or fight each other or sleep with each other. You know, it was like a den of iniquity. But everyone who used to go in there used to get all glossy-eyed. Oh, can you remember the mess or whatever? It was just a, a massive drinking culture. And how people, you know, these people that you say to me about it being a professional service, how you could come out at dinner time, knock four pints down and go back into a job is just not, you know, it's not professional service. So again, that drinking culture, some of that was brought up around that. Um, having on-site pubs, if you like, or bars, which, you know, how many, prof how many professions would, would you have that? Would you see surgeons going, necking a few at dinner, or firemen, or policemen, or something like that? It wouldn't happen, would it? So, no, no, it's certain professions it was known for, isn't it? Like journalism was a big one, wasn't it? If you had journo, you had a bottle of whiskey in your bottom drawer, and yeah, uh, police detectives were famous for it in the seventies, weren't they? For, for drinking their scotch. I know some good lads who were in CID in Sheffield. A uh, couple of them played rugby. All they used to do, very cliche, but you know they would tell you. They'd have the suit on, they'd be going around pubs looking for criminals, pint, back in car, pint, pictures, trying to find people. Massive drinking culture. Um, it's got a lot of chance for alcohol, really, hasn't it? It's not, you know, obviously the government make a lot of money off alcohol. When, when you look at it, we're talking about it now. Life is, is revolving around it and there's no restrictions or whatever. Um, a lot of deaths in this country, alcohol related, aren't there? So it, it deaths, all comes back to that. Violence, depression. Violence, yeah. You know. Um, but yeah, the, the prison service, again, yeah, it did have bars on site or whatever. And when they talk about it, you know, it was it's, just um, a sense of iniquity. What about mace, masonry then, as in free Freemasonry? I mean, that's... Been... Uh, I've no doubt there's some governors. Uh, there was one lad who was an officer who... He used to go to a lodge. At the top levels, I, I've no doubt um, there's a lot of it goes on. I know very little about it, me. The, the lad I'm thinking about now, when he used to talk about it, he used to have dues, he used to take his missus. There's sort of a... I, I think uh, an accepted side... You know, that um, it's just like a bit like a posh gentleman's club that, that women can go to occasionally. But I think on the dark side of it, you know, they, I know people who, who've done some really bad things and, and they got off because of who they knew, mm. who, who were sort of into this Freemasonry and that. A bit of a dark place. I don't know a lot about it. So, but yeah, there's definitely some people that are involved yeah. in that. Yeah. And so, yeah, talk us, what's it like rocking up there on your first day? I mean, it's fair to say it, it's, um, there's some serious guys in there, you know, 
there's some seriously serious men in there and I mean you weren't I guess you weren't young which went in your favor well I well when I my mean, first day at strange ways out of training I remember it quite well um there were five of us started on K-Wing, 200 prisoners on that wing. Now, I'd already been in private sector, me, so I'd already worked in a prison totally different. The culture was totally different. I wouldn't say I was intimidated. However, you know, people might think because you'd already worked in a prison or whatever, you know, you'd be, you'd be comfortable or, or you'd be used to surroundings or you knew what to expect. I decided the first day after about an hour, right, forget you ever worked in prison, just go go with the other four guys who are starting with you and, you know, just, just learn it from the bottom. It is a very, very strange place to work. So how, you know, how old were you, Sammy? This when I joined the private sector, I think I was about 40, mm. something like that, you know, so... Like I said, I'd done 23 years in engineering. It was, uh, but it was still a massive shock. Why do you, just for our listeners, why do you refer to it as private sector? What Right, private sector prisons. They're prisons that are run for profit, like a lot of American prisons are privately owned. So basically, when, when I worked at Forest Bank, uh, Sodexo, who are a French catering company, um, they built the jail at a cost of around 55 million. It, it came in big chunks of concrete. It was built very quickly, 12 weeks. And then our government then paid them to house prisoners. Now, at that time, I think Forest Bank had got a capacity around about 1,133 springs to mind. They used to get paid for every bed. So if they had 100 prisoners in there, they'd still get paid for 1,133 people, mm -hmm. as it were. Th that changed over the years, but it was basically bums on seats. They'd get around about £33,000 a year to house a male adult or something like that. I believe that prison inside two years started making a profit. So 55 to build, two years running costs, you know, all your heating, your food, your staff, and they still started making a profit inside two years. So that, that shows you the money that, that these places can can is make. It, Sorry, go on. I'm just going to say, is it worth pointing out, if you're putting this in the hands of privateers, you know, these greedy corporations, they're not going to have any interest in rehabilitating people, are they? They they just want to build more prisons and and they just want them to go what do you call it? Like a repeating cycle, so they keep... Well, to, to be fair, the, the private sector, the private sector always got a bad press from public sector. What people don't understand is when you open a new prison, 90% of them staff are green. They've no experience, no clue. All the prisoners you fill it with are experienced, so they take the piss. You know, it's an intimidating place to work. They usually take a couple of years to settle down, and if there's going to be a riot, they reckon it's going to be inside that first two years due to inexperience. Um, what the private sector was pretty good at was leading the way in a lot of things. Because they were running a business and the government were paying them, the government could say, right, you need to provide purposeful activity. So when I was in the private sector, they had workshops where some prisoners went to work every day and they could get a skill. They had a welding shop. They had an uh, automotive um, vehicle shop, you know, where they were rewinding starter motors and things like that. They would have maybe, I remember one company coming in, they started building double glazing windows and doors, sunbeds, all sorts of different things. So people were going to work. At that time, I think they were getting about £25, £30 a week, which is a massive amount of money as a prisoner you'd actually pay them to go to them workshops. But they could learn skills. Um, they had a bricky shop as well. So they, they were getting purposeful activity. And also other things, the private sector were first to introduce bank accounts for prisoners. These are things people don't think about. You go in prison, come out, you've got no credit, 
you, you can't get a check from um, from the social because you need to deposit it in a bank, this sort of thing. They started providing prisoners with bank accounts and things like that. So they led the way in a lot of things. Mm. Plus, because they were a private prison, they said, right, you're going to be open all day. So get prisoners out at seven in the morning, lock them up eight at night. So it, it was quite an exhausting day because prisoners were out of cells a long time. So the bad press comes from poor wages and not a lot of staff. However, they were quite innovative in some of the things they did. You know, like again, loosely speaking with a rehabilitation, but they at least give people a chance to, to maybe learn a trade or learn something that would be useful on the way out. Mm. But yeah, you know, public sector and private sector now, no different. Same wages, 22 grand a year. Yeah. And I always say this, and it's not, that money is just above retail or whatever. And when I said that, I am not knocking anybody. I know people who, you know, work 50 hours a week and lucky to come out with a grand a month. But as a prison officer with the stress and everything else involved, 22 grand a year. Prison officer's pension age, bearing in mind what you know about the job, is 68. They expect you to work in that job till you are 68. It's no office job, that, mate. So the same staffing levels now and the same wages. So the public, public sector, like we always do in this country, instead of lifting the private sector up with conditions and wages and things like that, They've dragged the public sector down. So same staffing levels, same wages, private or public sector, which yeah. is a shame. It's a shame. It is. Let's talk, Sammy, about the kind of rough stuff then. I mean, we're talking what I've made a few notes here. We're talking gangs, suicide, this cell fires you, you mentioned. Is that is cell fires? Is that a big thing? Um, I'm hoping this summer with a lockdown, it doesn't get bad. You know, people don't start kicking off and rioting, or as it's known now, uh, mutiny. Cell fires historically would happen in places like segregation units, which is like solitary confinement, that sort of thing. The shoe, if you're in America, health cares where you've got mentally unwell people, very occasionally to get on a wing. A cell fire is not something, it's not an everyday occurrence. Um, they are incredibly scary. But like I say, you know, that that is the extreme. That Because obviously people are, are then putting their lives at risk. Um, is that people, is that a prisoner setting his own cell on fire or is that someone setting fire to the prisoner's cell? No, that would be a prisoner setting fire to his own cell. Um, I, I saw quite a few fires in the private sector. You know, it, it, it is extreme and some of it is controlled. Don't get me wrong. If, if you're in a room the size of a family bathroom, to set a fire in there and not alert people you know, it's quite an extreme thing. So some people, you know, they may press an emergency cell bell, which you have, and then set a fire or something like that. But there is one or two people who, you know, I've seen set the cells on fire with no consequence to the cells at all. Um, like I say, it, it's, it is very extreme, that. And who... Um, have you had to run to one of those cells and fight for oh, yeah. the aftermath? In the private sector, we had um, five when I was down the uh, segregation unit in space of about, I don't know, six weeks. I can I can remember, I won't say them now, uh, there was David, who was a paedophile. I'll just use the first names. Uh, a young lad from Rochdale, uh, John. There was, uh, what's his name now? Neil. He was a scouser. He was in for a, a road rage injury scent. There were George. He was an addict. He was another scouser. And his name will come to me shortly. Five fires, all in a very short space of time, which is unusual that. One of them, that was well underway. Literally walked past. 
very little smoke. What the lad had done is it, it got damp tissue and it gone all the way around his cell door and sealed it from the landing. If you can imagine that, they had small vents in the windows that were pretty much open all the time. And he'd set his cell, and it was literally, I walked past close to the cell door. You know, it was one of them. Put my hand out like that, red hot, looked in, boom. So, and he, we, he, he was actually pretty much dead, that lad. We dragged him out. He was on fire, got burns to his hands. Smoke coming out when you were doing the compressions. Pretty horrific. So he obviously wanted to end it. He was looking at a big sentence. And he was, um, I wouldn't say it was remorse. I think the fact that he was doing a big sentence or going to get a big sentence, he, he couldn't handle it. He was not a, a strong person, as it were. So, but yeah, really horrific. So they, I know they, they take put measures in place in prison to, to not let you have the materials with which to commit suicide or, or to harm another prisoner. But what, what ways do prisoners find around it? Well, at that time, smoking was still allowed in prisoners. So if you're on a wing, you could buy lighters and matches. In the segregation unit, we used to take them off them. They could still smoke um, when they went on the exercise yard, but we'd take tobacco, matches, that sort of thing off them. But unfortunately, a lot of people secrete them on their body, shall we say. Um, as far as risk, you know, there's only so much you can do. Um, when we were in the segregation unit, I was on health care. You know, we did, they, they were given a razor to have a shave, and you took that back off them. Um, weapons, every you'll have seen them. You've seen the documentaries on American prisons, British prisons. Same weapons, don't matter what country the jail's in. Shanks, bladed weapons. You know, HMP, they have plastic knives, a standard plastic knife. Rubbing that on a wall, you know, get a nice shot of points on it, it goes straight through someone's rib cage or whatever. So plenty of bladed weapons, shanks, stabbing weapons, they're everywhere. And as you can imagine, Chris, very cliched with prisons. You get a pillowcase, put a couple of tins in it. Are you over there with that, mate? You I'm gonna do you some serious damage. So it's not so much that they, they can't make weapons or drink weapons. It's, you know, trying trying to keep it level so that people aren't stabbing each other and seriously arming each other. But like I say, at the minute, assaults on staff, assaults on prisoners, it's horrendous. The figures, all the figures over the last two years have gone through the roof. Self-harming, self-fires, assaults, drug use, everything's up. It's um, it's in a really bad place at the minute, mate. I went to um, Dartmoor. Dartmoor's probably about 20 miles away from where I live, and I took my um, my friend was visiting, so we went up there to check out Dartmoor. We went to the prison museum, and they had a display of all the weapons they found, or at least some of the weapons they found over the years, and it was quite a quite an eye i think i think oh i think there are even some firearms in there um i'll try and dig out the photos and put them in our podcast it was yeah blimey yeah the, the, pr pretty much you will find they're all the same world over same weapons shanks like i say mm. stabbing weapons um i've even seen people sort of manufacturing machete type weapons you know in workshops and things like that so and, and um, strange ways you mentioned firearms. In strange ways, one of the lads were telling me round about 1990, somebody actually smuggled, um, I think it was a small pistol revolver in, which obviously is an absolute nightmare. So mm. I don't know what the repercussions were. They do know took it in. You know, that, that was way before my time. But like I say, a lad I know was, was telling me about that. So, yeah, that that would be a nightmare scenario for any prison and you you often hear the expression or or instances of prisoners hanging themselves in their cells is that is that something that anyone can do if they put their mind to it right um 
Definitely, definitely. You know, there's um, there's big things about deaths in prisons. You know, particular prisons, strange ways had a bad reputation. If we if we break break it down to its basics, there's a lot of cliched stuff. People say that people are serious taking their own lives won't tell you. Well, I I I've known prisoners going to take their own lives. They have told me one lad, who um, he was a very troubled soul. I knew he was going to take his own life. I said to him, you are going to kill yourself, aren't you? He said, yeah, I am. He said, I'm not going to do it while I'm here. He was on the healthcare when I was there. You know, you, you, you put security reports in, you put things in place. At the end of the day, you can't watch every prisoner uh, 24 hours a day. If they're in crisis, they might be on what you call a constant watch, which means someone is sat watching them 24 hours a day. Uh, they have intermittent watches, which means you might be checking someone on five times an hour. But ultimately, if someone wants to kill herself, there will be, you know, a, a period of quiet, a period of time. These people hung themselves in double cells. So somebody might be on top bunk asleep and, and the pad mates hung themselves at the bars. If, if I break down all the deaths in custody of people I knew, didn't necessarily kill the cells on my wing or whatever. You know, some were a shock. You know, they didn't appear to be that sort of person. Some people were troubled, whether they were on a big sentence, um, couldn't couldn't deal with a crime they committed, you know, that sort of thing, remorse. There was three brothers actually died in strange ways. All bad drug users and all drug-related deaths. So the, the deaths in custody things, when people, you know, people sort of go on these campaigns and too many deaths, some of them you're not going to stop. You know, some of those people, I truly believe, if they weren't in prison, they still would be taking their own lives, you know, whether they're troubled by the past, you know, being abused, that sort of things. Um, it's, it's far more complicated than, than, it's almost like, obviously it's difficult for people who lose loved ones in jail. Yeah, if you've got a loved one in jail who takes their own life, there's a lot of emotion and things like that. But it's not as straightforward as things. We've had people who could have been statistics in strange ways, two or three, who've left. Uh, one lad, two serious attempts at strange ways, to take his own life. Um, he went to Risley, you know, in good spirits, off to Risley, and he killed himself there. Uh, there's another lad we had, another very troubled soul. He actually cut his throat at strange ways, had a really good go at it, almost died. And then he went to kill himself. He went on to kill himself, young himself, in a mental health unit um, in Manchester. So, you know, not, not as simple as people think, obviously. No. There's a lot of troubled people in prison. What percentage, then, of prisoners are, uh, shouldn't really be in there? They should be in a hospital or, or some sort of facility. I, I would say, you know, um, probably 20% shouldn't be going to jail. Okay. But they need an alternative. It's all right people saying low-level crime, you know, like robbery. There's drug addicts that were our sort of age who've done 50 sentences, yeah? The sentence might only be three months, six months. But what you have to think is, while, while that guy's out for three months, he might do 30 robberies uh, on old people's homes. And although he might not harm them old people, them old people then will be living in fear. They might lose, uh, you know, items that add value to them. They can, they can do a lot of damage that way. So people saying low-level crime, don't send it. You need, to, you need some form of punishment. Because mm. otherwise, everyone would just be out robbing, wouldn't they? Or shoplifting. If there's no consequence... If you can go in any shop and rob and know you're not going to prison, you're just going to carry on doing it. There needs to be something there. But I, I would think 20% of prisoners, you need an alternative, you know, a realistic alternative. Whether you make them go to work five days a week, give them a bit of self-worth or something like that. Um, mental health, the facilities in prison are poor. That's no fault of the prison service. I don't know, something like 70% of prisoners have got a, a mild personality disorder. 
The more acute cases, there's just not enough beds in this country, like we've already said. Mm. You know, if, if somebody turned up at any A&E department and they decided that person, you know, possibly was going to harm themselves or somebody else, the chances of, of getting them a bed are, you know, pretty small or whatever. So, yeah, they, they could reduce it by 20%, I would say, but they need something in place. It's all right getting emotional and saying we're just – you know, locking people up and throwing away with the key. You need an alternative, and it's got to be realistic. Otherwise, crime can just escalate if there's if there's no sort of, you know, no consequences or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, it's a difficult one, isn't it? I mean, like I was, I was really lucky in a sort of tragically, well, not tragic, but a sad way. Is, I, I had a short, sharp shock, as in I was that close to going to prison. Um, this country? Yeah, yeah. Well, pro prob <laughs> probably other countries as well. Certainly Ho Hong Kong, I would have gone to prison for a long time if I'd ever been caught with drugs over there, which I pretty much had on me almost every, you know, every day for, for about a six-month period. You don't want to end up in a Chinese... Um, no, I would imagine some of the foreign prisons are horrendous. Yeah. But no, in this country, when I, I, you know, went through a very wayward period as a young man, I narrowly avoided prison. Um, what I will say is, I, I, I literally had a short, sharp shock. It was enough to just shake me out of my stupid pattern of behavior that I accepted as normal and become part of who, you know, be, when you're young and you adopt a criminal personality, it becomes a part of you. It becomes your identity. And you, and we, you, the thing with identities is we justify it by saying, yeah, well, I'm this because of this. And I'm like this because of this. And uh, it needed me to be slammed in the cells facing a lot, you know, quite a likelihood of prison. For me to go, oh, Christ, what have I been doing? What have I been doing? And the overwhelming thing that came in my head was, why didn't I put all that time, you know, why didn't I put that time and energy into doing something legal? Learning, a, you know, starting a business or learning a trade and I'd have my freedom now. And it's horrible when you lose your freedom. It really is a, you know. You just in. I mean, I'm talking about me. Obviously, I just instantly felt, you know, massive regret and that sort of thing. But yeah, was, you, you see, you know, on the regret from, I've never regretted anything, me. Mm. Do, you, do you think you honestly do regret it, or it's just okay? I know. I, I I like to I, reflect on things, me, I, more than regret things. Let Let me just reframe that then. What I mean is, Sammy. I don't want anyone listening to me now thinking that robbing people is an okay thing to do. It, yeah. it, it's only going to end in negativity in your life and obviously the person's life. It's, well, of course it's not, it does. There's always going to be know. victims. Yeah. And you're both going to be victim. You're going to be a victim of your mindset and your circumstance. And of course there's a, and I don't want anyone to think in any way I thought I was clever or this, that, and the other. It was a, it, 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 it it, it, it wasn't, are you asking me, do I regret, you, you, you know, my life experience? Well, of course not. You know, uh, you know uh, like yourself, you, you get to the age, don't you, where you realize this, you, you know, the only way we learn in life and the only way we not just become better people in society, but we become more balanced in ourselves is we learn from our experiences. And if you don't yeah. have any experiences, I'm going to, kind of think you, you I, I don't I don't kind of know what person that's going to be maybe a bit of a sort of a living zombie sort of person you know um, I think the, the thing that we're really good at and, and this isn't necessarily a good thing is adapting I always use this little story right it's a Somalian prisoner coming to strange ways so I was working overtime, I was in reception me, and if you're in reception working overtime, inevitably you'll be strip searching people. It's a high security jail. So everyone who come in, strip searched in reception. 
So we used to have like um, like a fitting room in in any shop where you take your clothes and you'd have a curtain, take some guy in there, you'd strip the top half, give them a t-shirt back or something so they weren't fully naked, then strip the bottom off. But it was a full strip search. So we had this Somalian prisoner, um, really well spoken, not brilliant English, but he understood English, really smart suit. He's coming to a high security jail, first time in prison. We've got him in this little room. He was absolutely crapping himself, mate. He ended up curled in a ball up floor. He either thought we were going to leather him, we were going to get a kick in, or he was going to get sexual assaulted or raped or something, or both. Anyway, it took a while. Talked him through it. Eventually got him stripped and off, right? So he ended up on K-Wing where I worked. So I always remember this is only a couple of weeks after. We've got this guy in prison, first time in prison, high security jail. He's been stripped, you know, panicking, fearful. Two weeks later, he was working on the servery where he served food on K-Wing. Now, the servery could always be a flashpoint. You remember, these eight lads serving food. You'd have a long queue of prisoners, you know, and you're putting chips on the plate or whatever, and you, you, you get some gobshite or bully, give me some more chips or whatever jog on sort of thing. You know, you give him some more chips, the 10 lads behind him want more chips, and you're going to have bother. And he was on the survey, you know, giving it the lingo with people, give us another sausage, move on, that sort of thing. So he'd come into prison two weeks, he'd adapted, yeah, which I'm saying it's not a good thing. So from being fearful of being raped or battered, he's on K-Wing, the biggest wing in the jail. It was like a zoo. And he's got one of the hardest jobs on the wing. And he's just there. He's just doing it like he's been doing it every day all his life. And when you look at that, you realize that's why prison, once people have been, is, is no longer a threat to anyone. You know, the, the regime is restrictive. You know, if you've got your family and you love your family, seeing them four times a month for an hour or whatever is not brilliant. But as far as adapting, people very soon get used to this. You'll have done that yourself. I remember seeing one at podcasts. I think it was Sean, when you and your mate, I think you were maybe had some chemicals or whatever, and you were in that, that club with some mafia-type guys, you know, back-chatting them and things like that. You just you just get used to that environment, don't you? Where a lot of people would have thought, we're off. You just, it becomes part of your life, and it's, like I say, you've adapted, it's normal. It's not normal, but it, it's normal to you. And that's the scary thing about people, yeah, I think. It, it, uh, as, a, as, a, as a former Marine, or when you're a Marine, you, you don't realise how utterly extreme your stories are to people that haven't been in the Marines, right? And this is the yeah. same thing. Um, I've, I've so many times in my life, I've told a story, and it's not to be big-headed, it's not to be brash, it's not to be hey, big up me, it's nothing like that. It's just you go, oh, yeah, well, I was in so-and-so once, and then this guy pulled the gun, and then we did this, and then he's there, like, shoot. And you're, you're telling it because that's, that's the life you've lived, right? Of course it is, and it's normal to you. Well, not. It's never going to be normal, but it, it's normal to you as your sort of... Yeah. Then afterwards, this person goes, Chris, that story you told there, like you're making it up, right? And it, two things that tells me. One is like, wow, how weird is it to, to think in your head another person needs to make shit up? That says a lot about that person, that you know, the person that's asking. Um but the other thing is that, gosh, yeah, sometimes we have to do a reality check, check and remember life life as a British service, well, I'm, I'm going to say the Marines specifically, it, it's, you know, it's, it, it's just extreme. I mean, I, I mean, I, I still meet people now that haven't seen a dead body and probably wouldn't know how to deal with it if they did did see one right it's it's, inter it's it's very interesting that you say that um ag again 
like you say, it, it's not big headed. You, you have lived your experiences you've lived. And, and I saw some of this whilst dealing with a, a death in custody. We had a young lad, he was 26. I think he'd done five years. I, I don't know what he'd been in. He, he was an ex squad. He'd done five years. He was 26. Um, and he, he was in shock. He, he didn't actually get hands on. We weren't directly involved, but he saw staff dealing with, you know, trying to resuscitate somebody or whatever. And, and afterwards, you, you could tell, you know, he was white. He ended up, you know, being sent home. He was off a couple of weeks. He had some counselling or whatever. And, and I felt really sorry for him. But then, you know, you hear other people talking about him, where he's supposed to be in a squad, he's supposed to be tough and all. You know, it's totally... I think a lot of people not necessarily have dealt with it, but they sort of dismiss it and dismiss how it affects other people. But it's like when I've been telling my stories. Well, they're not actually stories, they're events. You know, they're very clear, details very clear, because you've dealt with that, and you're not telling them for effect to shock people is because people, you know, they're, they're, they're asking you to speak about these things. Um, but it's not, you know, it's, it's not, again, it's not something that you want to see, you know, you don't want to be see people arming the cells and cutting their throats and setting the cells on fire. Mm. But it, it was just sort of part of my, my job, which again, sounds a bit strange, doesn't it? You know, but it's, it's like things in life. Um, p people, there's always people, if they haven't lived that, that are going to uh, question what you're saying. But that, you know, you just brush that off, don't you? you? You You've done what you've done. Your experiences are what they are. So just take it as that. But they're also interesting. You know, people find them interesting, which is why they want to talk to you, you know, and they, and they want to know about things like that. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Some of the scrapes I've been in over the years, just I mean, we're just being in being in Northern Ireland. How do you even explain what it's like to be walking down the middle? I mean, when I say the middle, down the white lines of the road in the middle of a a, a British city, and you've got a machine gun in your hat. It, you know, and the traffic's all, you know, they're stopping for you and it's, and you're 19 years old. And at any minute, things start going bang, 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 or boom. And it's, and it, you just take it on the chin like it's normal. Like this is, oh, well, this is what I joined up. This is the job I'm, I'm doing. This is completely normal. And of course, it's, it's kind of not normal for most people, is it? No, it's not. It's it's like now when you talk about sort of your frontline NHS workers and that. You know, you're in NHS, that's your job. So you go to work and do that. It don't mean that you're probably not terrified or whatever or extremely stressed and other things, but that's your job. Um, and people don't understand that. I've got a, a ex squaddy mate who was in Ireland. I think he went over 69 to about 72. And then he did a bit of a, another tour after. So he was there pretty much three years um, constant. And he, he told me when he went over there, that he, like you said, his sergeant, and this is the only squaddy I've ever heard tell it like this. His sergeant said, listen, we're going over here today. Um, we don't want to go. They don't want us there. He says, don't take anything personal. Yeah, it's going to be dangerous, but don't take it personal. And he didn't. He's the only squaddy I've ever spoke to about the troubles in Ireland, early troubles, who has not spoke, you know, he's, he's not bitter about it. He was in some really, really bad scrapes, like you say, in not normal situations, but he's not bitter. It was just his job. And we quite often talked about bravery you know using when they say somebody's brave or, or are brave prison officers it gives a wrong impression that you know mm. it, it was my job so that's what he did like prison officers now it's not a pleasant environment you know when you said bravery you, you sort of i think people you know i don't know they see someone going into battle with a, a gold 
aura around them or something like that. They're just normal people doing what is not a normal job. And that's what Terry said. And interestingly enough, I also had a friend who lived through the troubles at the same time. And hers and his stories are very similar. But obviously, you know, she was a good Catholic girl. So she was looking at, at sort of like the British invading or whatever. But the stories are very similar. So I find it fascinating me. And like I said, you, you perhaps, well, you wouldn't have put when you were like 16 and thinking about joining Marines, put yourself in your positions you were in, would you? However, you know, that that's that's just where your job took you. And when we talk about bravery, who said to Terry, he says, listen, some of the squaddies I work with shit houses. They were lazy and other things. He says, I weren't brave. He says, when you put a gun in my hand and it were loaded, I were brave. But other than that, I'm just a normal person. And I, and I think that sort of, it's, it's sort of very humbling. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, very much so. There's a whole nother conversation again about, this whole thing about calling service personnel heroes is just, uh, it's, um, I'm with you. It's not disrespectful. I had this with somebody. Somebody says, you know, you, you disrespect. I said, I'm not disrespecting anyone, right? Normal people doing what is not a normal job, you know, and, and that's how it is. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously there is people going above beyond, isn't there? There's always people that do heroic acts in everyday life. You know, uh, um, some uh, a, f a man who doesn't join the Marines because he's got a two-year-old son or daughter, way more of a, a hero than a, than a man who's got a, a son or daughter and joins the Marines. Because how's that kid, kid going to be with his one of his parents away nine months of the year? How... how how, what mental health problems they going to have when they grow up and you know well, I never saw my dad he was always away and when he went operational I had to sit you know worrying if my daddy's ever going to come home you know it's it's we got a very perverted way of thinking in this country and what people don't get is you know up until Vietnam you could just lie to the public create an enemy send these squaddies off to commit heinous acts abroad, which then not only damage and traumatizes them for life, but more people will then commit suicide after these, um, you know, after, after these wars than die in the war. And this is just our, you know, our side. There's not the, un, the millions more people in an innocent country that, that have been, you know, slaughtered, right? So this is what happened in Vietnam. What a lot of people don't know is there's an American, um, uh, you know, the American corporations were vying for business over there. They wanted it. They, they couldn't afford to have the communist North sweep down because they were all, you know, like, like corporations do, they were get ready to pillage that land, right? So there was an ever-increasing build-up of troops. Then you had the Gulf of Tonkin incident where they basically fabricated a, uh, a, an attack on, America, on an American ship. It completely wasn't true, but they needed an excuse to start the war. So they fabric. If anyone Googles the Gulf of Tonkin incident, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. Anyway, hundreds of thousands of, of deaths later, and the public are like, hang on a sec, what are we even doing there? This is ridiculous. All our young boys, I mean, it was obviously predominantly boys that were in Vietnam, are, are, are coming back in body bags or they're coming back with half their faces missing or missing limbs. And, and what, why, right? And public opinion turned against war. So the PR machine of these corporate psychopaths is like, right, how can we get these gullible young impressionable young men to go and fight our next illegal conflict right why don't we change the public persona from being what they call them baby killers in vietnam right because they were dropping you know hideous weapons on villages well we got to change that to a hero image that's why you've got this thank you for your service sir 
can I bu- can I buy you a cup of coffee? It's just complete brain. Why why are you buying him a coffee? Do you know what do you know what job he actually does? It's not nice dropping bombs on villages. That that there's nothing heroic about it. Not when it makes these idiots. You know, war is all controlled by these these guys. So that's why we've got this. Thank you for your service, sir. And that's why everyone's young people. I know, I know they think they're being respectful when they say it, but it's just a form of corporate, you know, corporate brainwashing. And until we, you know, can see through it, then we're just going to send our next lot of young men off, off to foreign shores to kill another lot of young men that ordinarily they wouldn't even have a problem with. You know, my, um, one of my best friends was an Argentinian. Imagine when we met and I said to him, bloody hell, you're like one of the nicest guys I've ever met. And, you know, they kiss and they they kiss you on both cheeks and it's always a big hug. Think, just imagine if we was in the Falklands, I'd have had to kill you and you'd have had to kill me. Why? <laughs> right? yeah, it, it, it is how, how people perceive things, isn't it? Mm. Um, so when, one, what, one of my, just, it's just not regret. Wanna, can I just well, finish, Sammy? Just so anyone listen to this, think twice before you say, use the word hero about just because someone decided to join the forces and not become a baker or a candlestick maker, or thank you for your service. You know, just think, why? Why am I saying this? You know, because it could be that you're brainwashed, and that's not a good place to be. Sorry, Sammy. Back to you, mate. No, no. I, I was just going to say. Like I say, I don't have regrets, but on reflection, I remember when I was probably 17, 18, 19, talking to my nan about her brothers, uh, my uncle Henry, um, my uncle Vic, etc., who all fought in war, 8th Army and that, and growing up, uh, they were all, I've talked about this before, they were all really strange people. I didn't know why, you know. They weren't unpleasant people, but... I always felt uncomfortable around them and felt they were strange. And then when my nan got all the pictures out and the letters that they used to write, you know, from North Africa and the medals and all this sort of thing, and you look at it, then, then you know, you sort, of, you sort of realize they were my uncles and that who, you know, nobody had a choice, did they? It weren't like, that, that's, that's the other thing. It's, it's, you know, these guys weren't all marching off happily. They were all leaving the, bloody families and loved ones or whatever. I can't even imagine it. And like I said, I don't regret it. I just wish when I were younger, I'd have been able to understand like sort of who they were and what they've been through, which, you know, I, I can't even imagine that. But yeah, I'm, I'm exactly the same as you with that. And a lot of people are. Terry, like I says, he says, you know, I'm not hero, not brave. Um, they're just normal people who, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of healthcare workers now. Um, going to work every day who are terrified, you know, got families and things like that. But like you said, that's their chosen profession and, you know, they're getting up and carrying on going to work. So mm. It's, mm. it's just a sad state of affairs really at the moment, isn't it? Yes. It's, um, again, <laughs> let's not go down another rabbit hole about, yeah. You know, I, I don't watch the news, Sammy, because I don't believe it's not. I don't. I, it's not that I don't believe anything on it, because that would be my opinion. It's that my experience tells me it's not true. It's well, not. yeah, there's the, and the other thing is it's all negative. You know, um, you know, take, there's positives in anything. Um, to be honest, I, I stopped watching the news a long time ago. One of my friends says, yeah, forget that, but I had a look. Same as newspapers. All we watch at the minute, we watch a... Uh, a, a daily update, which is usually about three or four minutes on YouTube of what's been said, so we know where we are in lockdown or whatever, and, and that's about it, how it's going to affect us. So, yeah, definitely. I was, I was laughing yesterday, because I watch, um, we watch a, a lot of, you. We, we mainly watch YouTube, so we can watch what we want. I do. And because we watch it on our big telly, it always comes up with suggestions on, underneath, because we... we I've never figured out how to log in to YouTube on the telly. So we get, no, <laughs> we just get loads of random stuff and they keep trying to brainwash us with the news. So there's a bar of the news across the middle of the telly 
of which we only ever watch when we want to find out what what the government is trying to brainwash people with next and so you've got one advert here i think it's for bbc news one here for sky this one's going covid19 death rates at an all-time high this one both the same day covid19 death rates at an all-time low and dropping fast <laughs> it's like they can't even get the you know they can't even get the narrative right but that the narrative's wow. irrelevant it's about instilling fear in people because when people are afraid they turn around and beg for control they beg that you know and it's ah once you see it or if you read 1984 that's quite a quick way to seeing it um it all comes it all, it all becomes um i don't know what it becomes i don't know if it becomes sad bad or i just i don't <laughs> just don't <laughs> deal with Sam. you know don't deal with it sorry can't to this life is too beautiful to let other people well that's it you, you know you've got to live your life and you know like i say i just worry about what's happening at the moment with people who are stuck at home and things like that massively hopefully they can tune into some do you know i had a letter yesterday from a very kind gentleman he sent me a massive package full of uh, military rations and gucci little outdoors gadgets and stuff he's obviously in that kind of light you know that's he's got access to that um, and he want he, he sent it because he knows I can put it on my YouTube channel and make a video of like showing people military rations and and I am really looking forward to making that video. And uh, there was a lovely whole handwritten letter just said, um, "Dear Chris, uh, father, my father died recently. I haven't got any siblings, so I've got no one to really turn to. I'm on my own." but your YouTube channel has been keeping me going through the lockdown. And I just want to say, and I, I won't go into the personal bit, but it was a, just a very, very, very thought, well thought out letter. And it was, it's, it's nice that you can, you know, nice that you can reach people in a positive way through, through social media. As yeah, it'll definitely, you know, YouTube and that it's the future for me. Mm. But I, uh, go on. No, 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 no. Go on. I was just going to say, I can see other media platforms starting up me, you know, once you start censoring people, I, I like to see all different points of view and then make my own mind up a thing, which I'm sure you do as well. But it's a, it's a good way of getting yourself out there and like you said, you know, helping people and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully more platforms will open up that are uncensored. Um, because I'm not going to say any names, but you know, the ones that we're seeing at the minute, are, 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 they, they are, you know, they're, they're curtailing a fundamental human right, which is freedom of speech. And when you stop freedom of speech, it's the same as when you stop comedy, you know, it's now people are telling other people that they're not allowed to laugh at certain things yeah. because, because they interpret it as being like this. When in actual fact, no, it's just comedy. It's that is how you want to interpret. Yeah, it's always been anti, you know. But they're two signs of totalitarianism. You know, again, or the Orwellian 1984 agenda, and we're seeing it get faster and faster every day now. Um, people, people who are just relatively harmless but speaking their mind into you know that thing up there, just getting deplatformed. It's what, 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 why, what, what have they said that's to be scared of? Not nothing. They just have a different opinion to the one that the, the agenda wants you to believe it's, it's, um, yeah, it's good. Mm. So can we talk about, um, famous faces in the prison? That, that must be that when, when you get a blooming footballer who's been a naughty boy and they're chucked on D wing or whatever, it, how, Joy Barton on B-Wing. <laughs> mm. um, the lad didn't do hard time. He got special treatment. But like uh, I've said before, that come from outside the jail. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you what. Jonathan Aitken, right? MP, 
we, we'll know uh, others might have to look him up. Um, he got done for perjury or something round about 2000 and spent some time in jail. At that time, he was touted as the next prime minister. So I met that guy, uh, really humble guy, really nice. Wanted to give back to the prison system. He, he did his jail. He was at three jails, did it hard. No specialist treatment. You know, I think he went to Belmarsh first. Just thrown in there, thrown to the wolves. And then you get the um, the ex-lord, uh, Archer. Plenty of books out there he's written. Um, two very different paths. Shall we say the then lord or ex-lord uh, certainly um, was treated with kid gloves. And I, I actually wrote, read, read some of his books just to see, you know, where he was coming from and that. And he talks about the prison service in a really bad light, but his, his treatment was uh, far from normal. What was, um, what, remind me again, what was he sent down for? Archer. Yeah. Or, I think it was tax fraud. Was it not like Lester Piggott, the jockey? He got done for tax fraud or something like it's that. It's so funny. Jeffrey Archer going down is in my mind in the same way the Iranian embassy sieges, the invasion of the Falklands. Oh, yeah. You know, it's one of those things that was just seminal a mo moment, you know, or a, or a real moment in time. I can't remember for the life of me um, what, it, what it was he did. But, yeah. I'm sure it was tax fraud or something like that. Uh, and when you say you know, they, when you say they get specialist treatment, what in what way? Well, like like Joey Barton, um, he weren't treated like another prisoner. He ended up with a Jim Audley job, which was the best. You know that that job is the best prisoner job in the jail, bar none. Jim Audley, you get taken over to the gym in the morning. You can have your meals over there, eat your lunch over there. Train when you want. You do the laundry and that. Keep the place clean. It's like, it, it don't get any better than that. You know, if you like your fitness or whatever. But he was pretty much given that job. Um, it, it was just treated differently. Even the staff on B-Wing, you know, he, he, he'd run about the place. And, you know, it's it's hard joy sort of thing. <laughs> Whereas you wouldn't normally talk, talk about prisoners like that. It was like he was one of the family almost. Mm. Uh, and if people are offended by that, they can be offended. He was treated differently. Uh, we had Bez from the Happy Mondays. Um, really small guy. He he did his time in the top jail. I think he was on H-Wing. Quiet, unassuming guy. You know, came in, did his jail. Talked to people nicely. Um it's, it's more infamous people that you deal with. Do you know what I mean? Some of these high-profile cases and that. What was it? What what was Bez in there for again? I think it was like, it wasn't domestic violence, but it was some, you know, some issue on that front. Mm. Uh, it was nothing in particularly serious. He's done a couple of prison sentences, I believe, but like I say, the lads who spoke to him and that, you know, he was just dead polite with staff. You know, just... Just under I, the radar, really, didn't, you know. I uh, I was walking through Manchester Airport, and me and Bez were, were, walked like that, right? You know, we, we literally just walked past each other. And um, I wonder now, in his life, if he's going, me and Chris Frawl, we walk <laughs> past each other. <laughs> no, I'm joking, obviously. He was just a re really quiet guy, very unassuming, like. Well, he's um, going to run. He was going to become an MP, wasn't he? Or run for member of parliament? Or was... yeah, there's uh, there's a few ex customers that have put the cells for MPs and Lord Mayors and things like this. How is it to be a, a published author now? Um, really, we had we had a bit of a rough time to start with. When when the book was due out, um, the missus lost her dad Graham at Christmas before my book come out. So you know. It, that that was an incredibly sad time. The book was underway, and we found out Graham had got cancer and that. Um, it lasted till Christmas, so it, it was really strange. You know, on the one hand, you you're doing something that not a lot of people achieve, but on the other, 
it was incredibly tragic sort of thing. So maybe maybe this last 12 months, you know, I sort of start to appreciate it now. I'm sort of grateful. Um, pride, pr being proud is, is not a word I sort of use. Um, what I, how I would say is, you know, um, if my mum and Nam were alive, they, they'd be proud of me. You know, they, they'd, they'd be so happy with what I've achieved. So from that point of view, yeah, it's all good. Yeah. I think, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a massive achievement getting a book out and it's, um, yeah, it's a, it, it's, um, it's something not many people achieve. If you think the number of people on the planet and the number of books, it's a minuscule percentage of society. Yeah. So. It's if, if anyone, you know, any of your listeners, or anyone's, you know, thinking of having a goat book, don't be put off. I mean, I was almost put off. If you Google it, you know, the, the figures, I, I don't know exactly, but like one out of a thousand scripts might get read or something like that. Mm. Like you say yourself, it's, you, you're never going to be rich, are you? Unless you sort of write in Harry Potters and things like that. Mm. However, you know, like, like we've said before, there's some fantastic books out there self-published in that so I, i'd give anything a go you know yeah. and people like yourself you've got stories to tell it's out there it's in print now one day you know your family might be, well they can can't they it's like a bit of a legacy as well uh, a living history really of your life so yeah it's yeah. all good mate brilliant brilliant and that's so 11 years as a as a prison officer at eight HMP Manchester, aka Strangeways. Is, have I got yeah. that right? Yeah, you have, mate. Yeah. Uh, Strangeways. That's a weird name for a prison, isn't it? How did that come around? Do you know what? Um, I've no idea, really. But it, it's always going to be there. It's never going away, is it? It's synonymous. I mean, every, everyone talks about the riots. You know, the riots. Mm. I'm surprised that no officer really has written a book about the riots, or they might have, but it's certainly, you know, not not the sort of thing I've heard of. But for, for prison staff, it's in my world, sport. mate. It's in. I, I, I'll, I'll come on. I don't. Sorry to interrupt you. I'll, I'll come on and tell you why it's in my book in in, in a bit. But yeah, what an iconic place. Quite, quite a frightening place. Very daunting, right? Um, initially, I worked in a private sector, so I had a bit of a bad experience in the private sector. I, I was actually working with kids then. I went on to work with kids, which is a fantastically rewarding job. Um, but unfortunately, the, the politics around looking after kids and that, the people that involved, you know, I, we had some kids who'd had horrendous childhoods um all all manner of things inflicted on them by the parents but it was the, the parents were still allowed contact which i could never get my head around um you know we had one young lad he was 11 he looked about eight who'd been abused by his dad and his brother and he still had visitations with his dad um you couldn't let him out of your sight but you know he he sort of adoration for his dad was just overwhelming and the fact that he'd, he'd been abused by him, it, it was just awful. However, you know, the, I, I did apply to uh, public sector prison. Strange ways, funnily enough, weren't my first choice. Um, I think I put Indley and Risley, which is two other Northwest jails down. And then I got, got offered a job at Strange Ways, like, which I pondered for a month. I almost ran out of time. And then I took it on, which I'm, I'm glad I did now. Because mm -hmm. if you're going to write a book about a prison, might as well have, you know, probably the most infamous prison in this country as the title or whatever. So, I was yeah. going to say, either that one or Alcatraz, isn't it? Alcatraz, yeah. Um, I don't think I was ever going to be working at Alcatraz, but there you go, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Bang on. So, And you talked about you applied for it. So what sort of process do, do you do before you become a prison officer? Well, you'd, you'd, you'd be really surprised. Um, there's a long form to fill in. They, they give you a couple of problems on that form. I can't remember exactly. You know, write, write down something in life where you, maybe you've had to sort of get involved with a couple of friends who've fallen out. You know, all, all the stuff they do is sort of, it's based around role play and that sort of thing, which we know in, in real life don't work. 
Um, so quite a long application form to fill in, three choices. You don't actually have a proper formal interview, believe it or believe it not, as a prison officer for the public sector. Um, the sort of a selection, which is nothing like your military selection, far from it. A fitness test, which at the time, you know, I, I passed quite easily. There's not a lot involved in it, but it's designed for men and women. So um, you, you would expect you'd, you'd be able to get through that quite quick. There's a bit of a bleep test in it, not to a, a high level, which is running between bollards uh, in tune to bleeps. I'm sure a lot of people have done that. Um, there's some role play involved. And there's obviously a medical. Um, the medical's your usual thing, blood pressure, things like this. Um, like I say, if you pass the fitness, there was a basic English and maths test. Read a passage, answer questions. The maths, there was about 21 questions. I'm pretty good at maths, me. A lot of them I could do in my head. I had a friend who would have been a really good prison officer who took the selection, as it were, three times. And every time he got to about question 14 on maths, he got them all right. But I think you had to get something like 17 out of 21 or whatever. So he never actually made it as an officer. But, it, but it's very basic, like I say, and not what people would think. I think, me, for now, it's really outdated. If, if they want to sort of re recruit and train people now and recruit the right sort of people and keep them in the job, they need to look at it seriously. It's very flawed. I mean, the fact that you're not interviewing someone and... When you do the role play, you're sort of videoed and you're assessed by other people. So as we know, that that's flawed in itself because, you know, I, I could pass this guy and fail that guy. They might be a good officer, them not so much. So that it, it's all outdated. And when you actually do the training, eight weeks training, you do a week CNR, you control and restrain. You know, it's loosely based on martial arts, wrist locks, this sort of thing. The rest of it, classroom work, boring little tests lots of homework role play you know it's not really fit for purpose you don't prepare you for the job the best thing you could do is you see an order first week and then get people in the jail you know get them alongside an officer shadowing them maybe four days a week for seven weeks that way you'll have some experience in the jail and you'll see what you're dealing with like so it's, it's not what you'd expect at all chris not at all and I now unfortunately you... sorry now, unfortunately, um, the only people applying for the job, because it used to be a good pension, 29 grand a year, it's now 22 grand, and there's just lots of young people going for the job, so, which is difficult. You know, I, I don't know what you were like at 18, 19, 20, 21, but imagine doing that sort of job. Me, I'd, I'd, I've either been fighting or, you know, it had just been horrendous, so. Yeah, Sad state of affairs. Sad state of affairs. It's one of those jobs, especially as you're predominantly dealing with young, I'm guessing for the most part, young men, way, wayward young men, I'd say. Um, as in like they can do with a bit of fatherly guidance, I'm guessing a lot of them. Oh, well, def definitely. Definitely. Uh, and and to, if I you shoved me in there at 18 and 19, I probably would have been a little Hitler that thought I knew it all. And... Um, well, you don't know how to talk to people, do you? At that age, you don't know how to interact. You've got no life experiences. And, you know, there, there is a youngish population, but, but if you also look, you imagine a 40-year-old man, career criminal, and someone sort of 20, 21, talking down to him or not knowing how to address him or not knowing how to deal with aggression, then it, it's not good. It's mm. not good. What was your... I mean, do you want to talk a bit about your younger life? You don't it's, don't have to, like, tell all or anything. Me? But ha, ha, um, end up doing, applying for this? Well, I, I spent a lot of time in engineering. Um, a lot of boring jobs. You know, I've, I've written a book about prison, so with private sector, I did about 15 years in secure environments. I did 23 years in engineering, right? I did some bloody dangerous jobs. Uh, lots of hours. Uh, some dirty jobs. Um, unfortunately, I saw, you know, some really sort of bad things. One guy lost his arm. Saw someone die. 
Um, and and this is just just going to work. So you know, engineering. It, when when people talk about being in prison, I've got twenty three years. So a hard graft, seventy hours a week, shift work, that sort of thing. Um, you know, it's it's an hard way to make your living. And at that time, me, I was work hard, earn your money. Um, Friday night on the lash, Saturday play rugby, which I love. Saturday night on the lash and back to work. It was just like drink rugby work, drink rugby work, and sort of being an ex-soldier. I'm I'm sure you did quite a bit of that as well yourself. So me, me younger and there was a guy uh, on Twitter the other day got quite upset. He read me book and he said he said he got locked up. He he, he was in a car. He didn't know it was stolen. Car got stopped. He got two and a half years inside because he was in a stolen car, which he had no knowledge of. Similar situation myself. We got picked up by a lad we'd known from school. It was only 17, 18. Shot off in this car. Copper other way. He puts his foot down. Sort of sets in then. You know, what's going on? Adrenaline kicks in. Copper's chasing us. He let us out of this car. It was a shit hot driver. Me and my mate, Teddy Webster, who was a Marine, um, or went on to be a Marine, we got out of the car, he shot off, he ended up doing, I don't know, three years inside. So I had, I had lots of close things, lots of fights. Not, you know, I, I'm not a street fighter or anything, just as a teenager, going to pub, you know, arguing starts in a groupie, that sort of thing. And it's only this last couple of months that reflecting on my younger life, there's more times that I could have got locked up than, than I ever thought. I never really thought about it. Um, so I, I consider myself quite lucky. And like I said before, um, people can dismiss it, but rugby kept me on straight and narrow. I absolutely, you know, I live for Saturdays, me, rugby pitching, that sort of thing. I could have probably done with a bit of military discipline, but I, I don't know whether that would have gone the way. While we're talking about Marines, can I just tell you, two lads from school, one of them who's unfortunately dead now, Sean Ryan and Teddy Webster, yeah, they were of that group of lads when we did cross-country in Sheffield up at Castle Dyke who were always behind the wall smoking and took the shortcuts and that. And both them guys left school, still taking shortcuts and smoking. At 17, they both joined Royal Marines. And last time I saw Sean Ryan, I think he did 20, 22, 23 years. Terry Webster did 10 before he come out. And if anyone had said to me, you know, out of this lineup of lads, who's going to join the military and who's not, them two wouldn't have been in. So there you go. Yeah. That's it. I mean... I think the Marines is predominantly made up of people that were told you'd never do it. <laughs> That's why they joined. <laughs> yeah, my gosh. Um, so, yeah, what, so at what point did you think, right, I'll, I want to become a, do you went from engineering first in, into? I struggled. I, I got made redundant quite a few times. Um, I actually spent a couple of years uh, doing massage, Reiki, uh, sports massage, uh, did a reflexology course. You know, I was going down the complementary therapies route, which was quite unusual for a guy. It was uh, quite a female-dominated sort of career, that sort of thing. But I, I think ultimately I wanted job security. Yeah, yeah. You know, some some sort of stability. Like I said, lots of times got made redundant in engineering. And and again, people people nowadays, it seems that you, you can almost, you know, not be a good worker and still remain employed. You know, when, when I when I see people now, you know, these I, I was never late. Any any job I've ever had, prison service, eleven years, never late. The only sickness I had was work related, and same in engineering, you know, brought up with them sort of you, you were never sick from school, never late to school, all them old, old sort of values now, you know, they, they almost seem to, to hang on to people, you know, people who are poor timekeepers, bad sick records, 
we don't see many of that being in engineering at that time it, it was sort of on a decline really 80s 90s you know a lot a lot of engineering went abroad but i actually turned up at one company and i got called out on this but it's perfectly true there were whispers that the this plant we were working at would get sold to china and it was literally you know work saturday morning wash off go out on piss monday morning turn up to work few people there i were always there early big chains on gates that's it mobile phones weren't prevalent then no text message no nothing the gates were locked and it was at a later date that, you know sort of got a letter saying the plant had been sold you've been made redundant that sort of thing so quite a cutthroat industry um and you and you just get fed up you just you just want some sort of curiosity but also i, I would imagine you're quite like this or were I found in life sometimes need to be challenged. I was in a place where I was treading water. Um, I, I needed something different. You know, I moved into Manchester. It's only 50 miles away. The first 18 months when I joined the private sector, were incredibly lonely. I, I lived 15 miles out from the jail, which was a big mistake, but I, I had no idea of that. And I had no friends, really. I just, just worked and drank a lot of the time on my own. So when I was envisaging a new start, that weren't sort of the, the start I imagined like. So there you go. But but it makes you, doesn't it, really? Why is um why is alcohol such a prevalent thing amongst prison warders? Right, let, let me tell you, obviously my drinking, everyone will say they're drinking social. Rugby, it was Saturday nights, we used to train, and I, I never drank in the week. Um prison officers me, I would say, but again, when I was in the private sector, like, like I've said, I lived on my own, didn't have a lot of friends. So if, if you went out with people, you made a night of it, stopped at people's gas, did a lot of drinking when I was in the private sector. I think it's because of a stressful job. People just partied hard. Public sector, I can honestly say I never went strange ways, never drove in strange ways after having a drink. If I were working next day, I didn't drink, simple as that. I worked a lot of hours. So the odd weekend off, which was few and far between, you know, maybe Friday night and have a drink with Mrs. Sand Saturday night. A lot of prison officers drink every day. I've got friends, one friend, she, she's always insisted she's not alcoholic, two bottles of wine every night just to get to sleep. Doesn't recognise how much that is. It is the stress of the job. I think, I don't know whether it's a worldwide thing, but certainly British people, if you talk about relaxing, it's, you know, getting home Saturday night, having a few jars or whatever. In the prison service, there was um, a massive amount of people in that job who'd been in sort of the good old days. Um, I don't know before the 60s, but certainly 70s, 80s, lots of staff, lots of animosity, but 23-hour bang up. That started changing in the 90s. I was talking about a guy to my missus yesterday. When he left the prison service, he'd done 38 years. Yeah, so we're talking about having respect for people for the amount of time in a job. And I had no respect for him. Um, he'd been an alcoholic since he joined, pretty much. And he, he, he never lifted a finger to help anyone. Everyone knew he was a drinker. Everyone knew he was lazy. 38 years of doing that. But also, if you look at him, Chris, he, he didn't have the skills, he didn't have a presence, he couldn't talk to people, he got no work ethics, he got no empathy, no understanding. He was, he was completely unqualified, yet he spent 38 years in that job doing nothing, you know, with managers just ignoring him and, and going to somebody else. So for me, the massive drinking culture is, is the fact that a lot of people are in a job they shouldn't be in you know, the stress levels. Having said that, I worked with some fantastic people who were cracking offices. But again, um, you know, I think it's just, that there's that much stress in the job that, that it's just a release. And, and people used to hammer it as well, really hammer it. More, more than I've seen with rugby, there's a drinking culture about rugby, you know, a lot of divorces, a lot of alcoholics, that sort of thing. Well, that, that was probably before the modern era, but, you know, still happens. 
in the prison service, just, you know, lost some good lads as well. Mm. Um, early 50s, two or three lads I can think of now, drink-related illness, drink-stress-related illness. So, yeah, it's a, ter- it's a terrible thing, it's a terrible it's, thing. It's a lesson, anybody listening now, you know, Britain, we're a nation, we're a nation in denial. Um, you know, if it, 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 this is not a lecture by any means. I, I drank pretty much every day for 27, if not 30 years, you know, my, uh, my savior is five years old now, you know, well, my, there you go, you see. Yeah. My, my priorities changed and I had to step up to the plate and start, you know, taking some <laughs> responsibility because, um, yeah, I, I got no regrets whatsoever, but I've, uh, I've, you know, my, two of my best friends drank themselves to death. I mean, literally in front of me, if, if, when you see your friend in that state, all his, all his organs are packed up and, uh, yeah, this is it. This is it. So I'd suggest to anyone, you know, have a serious think about your drinking or it doesn't, doesn't mean you have to stop it here today or da, 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 da. But unless you start thinking it through, you never, you never get on that pathway to actually finding a way to, to, to reduce it. I'd say, you know what, Chris, Again, I was talking with Mrs. yesterday about this, the, the sort of consequences of what's happening now and this lockdown. We're very fortunate. We have a little a little spa not far from us, you know, where we can get milk and bread. I haven't really been to a supermarket for five or six weeks now. We go to a local farm shop. You know, it's quite civil, fresh produce. We've been eating that. But I was talking to one of the lasses in the spa and their alcohol sales... Um, three or four times what they were before. Mm. And joking aside, again, the bin men, uh, last week, it was the bottle bin, as it were, the recyclables. As I'm walking down with Dog, all you could eat, and I said to him, is it just bottles? And he says, that's all it is, mate. He says, they all weigh a ton. They're full of wine bottles and cans, Mm. and that's it. Mm. So, you know, we're talking about the, the stress of the job. If you look now... I think pretty much the whole country is quite stressed or worried or in fear and they're all turning to the ball. I'm, I'm, me, I'm thinking about the fallout in three, four months of what's happening now. Oh, massive. Um, much better, right? Much better than turn to bottle. Just turn the freaking TV off. Don't watch the news. It's so much simpler. I, I am 100% with you on that one. Um, well, I'm sat in conservatory now. We don't have a TV in here. You know, it's just a small addition to ours. I've got books behind me. I've started reading. I think I think boredom is literally going to be killing people and fear. So it's, uh, it's a difficult one. And certainly the mental illness aspect. James English, right, he encouraged me to uh, get on social media. So I got me sent a Twitter account. Um, obviously met good people like yourself. I've been inundated with, with messages from people on Twitter, uh, my Facebook page and, and things like that. People who've seen me on the podcast like yourself and, you know, here's a guy who's quite understanding or whatever. And if, if I just tell you now, there's the last now if she ever sees this. I, I don't know her real name. She's, um, she's called China Red. I just got a message the other day. China Red, uh, hi, can you talk? So I messaged um, this last bike. The missus were a bit concerned. She says, you don't know who you're talking to. I don't, but at the end of the day, you know, I'm not giving life advice. You know, I asked some pertinent questions, you know, what would you like to talk about? What situation? Where are you? And and these, if, if that was a one-off, it would be quite amazing because there's no name. They don't introduce themselves. They don't say, I've read your book or seen you on a podcast. It's just a message. You know, can you talk? Can you help me? I need to talk. Mm. And there's lots of people who are getting incredibly stressed at the moment. They've already got stress in their lives. And, you know, I, I think it's quite a worrying time. So I don't know. It's, I think it's going to shape my career because I, I'm deciding now. Somebody, somebody sent me a, a message on Twitter about some, some sort of course I should do. 
um, about going on to be a life coach or something like that. And, you know, and it's, it's the sort of thing I'm already doing. I'm falling into this without even trying. So, yeah, very, very strange times. I've got a Patreon platform. Patreon's like a platform. Of, it's a bit like a private Facebook, if you want to think of it like that. And my guys pay two pounds a month uh, just to support what I do. People who like my books or my podcast or whatever um, support me of two pounds a month. And in return, they get kind of updates on what's going on on the kind of um, podcasting front, for example, like my my chat with Robbie Williams the other night, this kind of stuff, they, they get the kind of inside deal. But also I do free life coaching for, you know, for them in, 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 even if that's just the a video every now and again, just to, just to keep people, keep people's spirits up and just keep them focused on their goals. Um, people I think definitely you, lead some leadership, mate. Yeah, definitely. You'd, um, you'd definitely be good at, good at something like that. Are but you enjoying Sam, what you're doing? I live in paradise, Sammy. You know, um, as I think we said this before, before the podcast, um, yeah, I'm just at a place in my life. I, I live in paradise and, um, that's not a, a physical place. It, it's, it's all in here. And it, 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 if you want to get there, it's available to everyone. It's, I mean, wise men have been writing about it for, for thousands upon thousands of of years it's called the scriptures you know and uh, sadly those stories have been taken by other people and, and put across as religion which is just too not even the same th being spiritual and being religious are two very different very different things sadly but uh yeah i i love it i love meeting meeting fascinating people like you i i i'm a, a lifelong learner so i'm listening to you and i'm learning you know, I'm, I'm learning, Sammy, and thank you for that. Well, you know, when, when you look at things like this, I, I think you get a lot of rewards from helping people mm -hmm. without realising it. Me, me certainly. If, if I could make a living from producing books and help people for free, I'd quite, quite happily do that. Mm -hmm. um, I did say about my book, if, if one person read it and sort of thought, well, you know what? that's me that's where i'm at and and as it happens it's lots and lots of people but certainly if, if you look now just just going to prison or anything the, the the sort of structures in place in this country for helping people with mental health are really poorly funded Even you know i don't think it just this country mate i think just it's a western you know, Western society isn't set up to develop the individual or build communities. It's set up to destroy it all. And as I, I say this a lot, if you destroy people, what do they do? You know, what do unhappy people do? They spend money to try and get happy, don't they? You know, they buy wow. the cars, they yes. buy a big, bigger house. And who, who, where does that money go? It goes to these sick corporations that couldn't care less about the planet, couldn't care less about me and you or our children. Um, E evil evil people and that's what i say it's not until you get into here and realize the paradise your happiness has been with you all along you you just never knew it because you kept you kept looking at every tom dick and harry and these rich psychopaths thinking that they're going to make you you know happy and, and falling through all the traps like buying the fast car and going for the position at work and you know no i'm not talking about career satisfaction now i'm talking about that Right, when I've done this, I'll feel like this. And, of course, you get there and you just feel the same person, right? But um, well, de Definitely. I, I think a lot of people need, you know, they need sort of leadership and things like that. I, I think a lot of the unhappiness around me when I see people now is the fact that, you know, people are, like you just said, they, they're struggling they're struggling to buy houses together. You know, if a couple, they have a child, they're struggling to buy houses I know when I was in the prison service, you know, um, I was talking to one guy the other day about this. He, he, he almost, he says, you know, I'm looking at your life and all this. And I said, whoa, 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 you know, I don't know. 
maybe six, seven years ago, I was in a proper rut, me. I was working silly hours. I weren't seeing my missus. I missed a good five or six years of my daughter growing up. So I was out at house at sort of, I don't know, six o'clock every day, back at 10. She was in bed. Um, and, and I was in that rut. I, I was just, you know, sort of thinking, is this my life now? You know, six, 60 hours a week in this job. Like you said, you get one day off, have a drink or whatever. Um, I'm certainly in a lot better place now. I'm a lot happier with myself. Um, but it, it, it's a, ultimately, like you said, it comes down to money. Um, you know, it's almost like people sort of sign up for one continuous loan that they're never going to pay off. Um, and it gets to you, doesn't it? It does get to you. You know, I mean, yourself, a very different life to me. But when I look in engineering, right, I did some shit boring jobs, dirty jobs, long hours, like we said. But it wasn't difficult. I just went in, operated machine 12 hours, took my money at end of week, you know, happy days. It, it wasn't, I think then, particularly in engineering, it was a laugh. The people I worked with, you know, you were having a laugh all the time. And, and it was that, that interactions that sort of took, you know, that that made the job more palatable or whatever. Mm. Whereas the prison service, you know, yeah, you did have a laugh, you had to. But also, you know, the the, the I had a laugh with prisoners. I've, I've always said me, if I could have my own little prison and staff it with people I knew, it'd be happy days. Mm. Um, definitely the old adage that it's the people you work with in that job, you know, certainly makes it hard. Uh, it, it's very strange. Like I say, I've got a couple of really good friends now who are ex-customers from Strange Ways. It's funny how your lives cross. And that's through the book. You know, girlfriend buys a partner the book to read on holiday. He goes, I know this guy used to lock me up. She gets in touch. We end up chatting, go for a coffee. Trafford Centre in Manchester, away you go. So, but you know, uh, as a, as a ex-customer i don't like ex-prisoner ex-offender as, as an ex-customer you know the the prison side of it for me you know it, it don't mean anything it's like now you know i'm four years out from being an officer or whatever so i'm just a civvy but i've, I've probably always talk about it and if, if i got a chance to be on question time i'd like the audience to be prison officers ex-officers current prisoners and ex-prisoners and put your MPs and all your reformers up there and, and let's do it that way. That'd be an interesting one, I feel, although it'll never happen, obviously. So writing a book then, Sammy, has that brought you any flack? Have you had blowback? It, you know. Do you know what? A very, very small percentage of negativity, mostly from the people I work with. Quite a lot of them of us didn't speak in too good a light. I'm still getting messages now, which th there's people I work with really closely who possibly I thought would be my biggest critics. You know, people I like, good friends who've been dead positive. Um, I, I'm getting messages now from one prison governor, really nice fella. You know, he says, I've just read your book. He says, I wish I could be honest and speak out like you have. You know, you're doing a good job. Carry on what you're doing. A lot of ex-prisoners, ex-customers, as I like to call them. A lot of current staff. I've just had a couple of messages from two two young lads working different end of countries. Both read my book. Uh, one's 21, one's 23. You know, I've read your book. Give me a good insight into the job. You know, it's just as you say, that sort of thing, which is really encouraging. Um, somebody I up in the prison officers... Union, the, the main British Union, Prison Officers Association, he, he said, I can't remember what chapter is. The last couple of chapters, I think, in the book are quite relevant when my mental health became unwell. You know, they sort of said, you know, everyone who's who's works in prisons, families should read this. Prisoners' families should read this. MPs should read this, you know, quite prevalent. So, no, I expected some flack, I'm sure. At the back of my mind, you know, you, we're not good at taking negative comments or negativity. 
but it's all been really positive. The social media has been super positive. Tiny amount of, you know, trolls, whatever you want to call them, which, you know, I'm, I'm not bothered about them anyway. So it's, it's been a really, really positive thing. And, Good. you know, I'm, it's, all, it's only this year, 2020, that I'm starting to sort of appreciate where I am. Hopefully... I'm not far off securing another deal, which would be really good. I'd like to do another book. Mm. But ultimately, I, I just want to help people in whatever way, Chris. You know, if, if that's earning a living and just talking to people and messaging them and, and doing things like that, then so be it. So be it. And um, can you talk about your mental health experience? Yeah, of course I can. Um, I, I became quite a wealthy Whilst I was working, I'm sure this happens with a lot of people, when I was in the job, um, that's the dog, obviously. <laughs> when I was in the job, I got, I got injured uh, September 2015. I injured my shoulder, sh shoulder quite badly. I knew I'd injured my shoulder. I ended up being off work a week, then two weeks, then a month. Um, my doctor signed me off. I became acutely unwell, really poor sleep. I, I really poor sleep in the prison service anyway, but I, I just couldn't shut down. Uh, I was maybe sleeping for an hour and a half, two hours a day, you know, dropping off and then you'd wake up or whatever. Just incident after incident going through my head. Um, not all of them bad things, you know, some of them, some quite positive and I, at the time, when my book came out, 2018, you're on a bit of a high. Your book comes out. I did some press. I did some paper interviews. You know, I said I'm getting better. On reflection now, 2020, this has been by far the best, the best time since I left the prison service. I was unwell last year. People would say anger management issues. It's just, it's not that. You, you must have had it yourself, especially when you're on drugs, mate. Lack of sleep is horrendous. People, when people talk about insomnia or whatever, or people have a bad night's sleep, months and months and months and years of poor, broken sleep, it can leave you, you know, short-tempered, irritable. Even now, you know, a couple of weeks ago, something from my childhood came into my memory, not a pleasant memory, and I must spend two or three hours a night just laid in bed calm not agitated not stressing which i used to be because i'm not sleeping we're just things mulling over cell fires you know things like that it's um it's bizarre i did a short stint on medication medication didn't suit me uh tried a couple of uh, different antidepressants um i was put on a statin for my cholesterol blood pressure medication none of which suited me I, I actually dumped all the medication, which I'm not suggesting anyone does. I decided while ever I was on medication that it'd be like a crutch and I'd never helped myself. So I, I think my therapy has been talking to people, getting on podcasts, telling people what that job's like, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so I am you, a people person. Do you think well, then that this lack of sleep that's, that's obviously taken its toll on is is that do you think that's a symptom of ptsd oh definitely i, d I don't like right P ptsd i'll talk about it briefly you might have heard me say this before bad bikes i have a friend i work with she she's no longer work now she's retired she's bed bound a lot of time she's got horrendous back problems she's on god knows how many painkillers she struggles in life to do anything if she goes to a wedding reception has a few beers and dances for two hours she's in bed for two weeks you know she can't put socks on or anything like that i've got a bad back from rugby however it doesn't stop me doing anything so i've got a bad back she has a bad back ptsd's like that some people yeah one incident might affect them for a couple of months other people you know squad is prime example firemen frontline workers police but anybody really you know i had i had a good friend who was in a really bad crash on the m1 
his wife lost her life. She was decapitated in the front of the car. He had two young children, five and six, or four and five, in the back of the car. They were trapped in that car for nearly an hour. You know, them them two kids, even though they were young, that would probably affect them all their lives. So for some people, PTSD, it's going to affect them throughout their lives. It's how much it controls your life and stops you doing your things. Me now, these incidents that I know will never go away, names will never go away. There's a lad called Alan Taylor. We had him on healthcare. He was the next squaddy, as abused as a kid. We had him on healthcare three times in strange ways. Three times we put him back, back out on street because he couldn't get him anywhere to live. He eventually hung himself in Manchester City Centre or just outside on a viaduct, yeah. Such a nice lad. You know, I, I connected with him. You know, he ain't got a bad bone in his body. His child, childhood experiences and his experiences as squad has obviously affected him. I think about that lad all the time. You know, not not by him hanging. I just, you know, just... It's, it's really, really hard to explain. Um, it's just there. Just pops in my head, walking with dog, think about Alan Taylor, Alan Taylor. And I think it's... He was just such a nice person. So, for me, PTSD made my mental health worse at the time um, with things that were happening in the prison service. But other than that, just let me get rid of that. Other than that, you know, it was just part of life. You know, when I've dealt with deaths in custody, gone to work the next day, you know, you don't get counselling from prison service. You don't get support. Your friends are your support. And things like that. So, you know, it, it's never stopped me doing anything. It's just been sort of part of the makeup. Whereas, like other people, one incident they're out of the job, um, or other people on medication for life and counselling, this sort of thing. Do you so, think? Did you find your your mental health experience? Did that kind of lead you to a, a breakthrough point in your life? You know, like a change or a turnaround or not i don't like the expression turnaround but i mean you're, you're a very em empathic person i'm guessing you were very a kind man to your prisoners all along but did it what 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 sort of came off the back of your mental health experience um i think you you, you take stock of where you are really um, you know, you, you look at things that are important to you. Pretty much every day, I'm I'm sort of look where I am, and, and I'm I'm quite pleased where where I am in life. Um, it's, it's not luck or anything like that. You know, I am I, I am quite a strong character. Like I say, I would not recommend anyone just coming off medication or doing anything like that. It's just I, I just got to a point where I, I was fed up. Um, round about, I don't know, maybe 2.16, I was just fed up of, and that that's quite early on, you know, I, I haven't been finished long, I just thought, you know, I need to try and do something, having said that, I, I was telling people in 2018 I was feeling a lot better, you know, uh, when, when I sat on Victoria Derbyshire on BBC Two, and says, you know, how are you now? And I said, I'm feeling much better. Looking back now, I weren't. I was still quite unwell. And and it's only this year, you know, four years after I finished with a prison service, that now I can say, you know, I, I, I do feel like I'm in a good place or whatever. It's really strange. You know, all the world's sort of on lockdown or whatever, and I'm actually looking where I am, appreciating what I've got. And I, But I'm quite sure that a lot of that is to do with this last six months, joining social media and talking to people, you know, getting nice messages from people, people encouraging you to carry on speaking about what you're speaking. And I'm, I'm quite sure that the best therapy for anybody is helping other people, you know, and, and I think that's where I'm sort of growing at the minute and that's what I want to do. Um, yeah. A mouthful that. Does that make sense to you? Hey, mate, it, to me, it, it, I, it's not just that it makes sense. You're, you're like talking my story, right? Because it, well, it's like all roads lead to Rome, isn't it? And Well, yeah. 
you know, it's like, you know, it's not good luck. I don't, I don't consider it's good luck that I am where I am. It's just sort of a path. Like, if you look back at prison, like I've said, I don't do regrets. You know, I can reflect on it. I've, I've got a book from that, which I never thought I'd do. But, yeah, definitely growing, helping people or whatever. And also, you know, alongside that, my daughter's sort of had a bit of a journey that's just starting. But my missus, you know, she's... She's had a troubled past and she's grown and I'm now seeing her, you know, she works with dementia patients um, in a home, which is incredible, difficult work, can be incredibly rewarding and draining. But, you know, that, that's also helping me. I'm seeing her grow as a person, which obviously because she's my partner, that, that has a massive, massive influence on me as well, how I sort of live my life. So um, I, I just... If you're a people person, you know, helping people, it, it's massive. And that's just what I, know I do. I could talk for hours about it and, and where you've been and how it affects you. But, you know. It's, some, it's just one of those bizarre laws in the universe that I'm, I don't think I'll ever be clever. Well, I'm, I'm never going to be able to explain it. But it's like when I started my YouTube channel, I just sat myself down and said, Chris, you're not doing this for you and you're not doing this for money. You're doing this to add value to other people's lives. And if you focus on that and that's your sole aim, so that means rather than make, you know, just say arbitrarily three videos a day, I'll do the one and a half, and then I'll spend the, the time I could have finished the second video replying to people that have writ, written to me. Don't always get time, folks, and, and obviously the more busier I get, that's going to get less, but, you know, making time for the, for the people that are, have supported me. And rather than do the, you know, the, the third video of the day, I'll pick up the phone. I'm talking to someone I've never met before who's got an issue and write, Come on, let's 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 hear it and let's let's get you back on the road to positivity and some lovely kind of breakthrough chats there with 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 people and off the bat of, of always making the decision is this benefiting somebody else? It's all working, Sammy. You know. In uh, fact, it, well, it, I went on the James English podcast, yeah. Got myself a Google account finally, and I couldn't go back to the very beginning. Me, me laptop kept crashing, but I thought what I'd do, everyone who took time to make a comment, positive comment, negative comment, you know, I liked and I replied. I spent about five hours going through leaving replies to people, you know, if people have taken time out. And I think that bit's important, like you said, just connecting with people or trying to keep in touch, which is, <laughs> I'm at a bit of a crossroads at the minute. I, I always tell people at the end of the message, you know, um, please forgive me. I've got like a couple of platforms at the minute. I'm replying to messages. You sometimes forget who people are. You know, like someone will phone me up. It's John. All right, John. Help me out, John. John X. John. John from Lincoln. <laughs> and then away you go, that sort of thing. Um, so maybe I need to get a bit better organised, especially for when I have my own channel or whatever. But yeah, definitely, uh, I just want to help people. And, you know, if, if we can live a fairly modest life, you know, I get a second book deal and it keeps me going for two years so I can help people, then I'm happy with that, mate. Yeah. Definitely. And obviously look after my family and, you know, make sure I look after my missus. Well, you, you, it's been a pleasure talking to you, Sammy, and finally getting to meet you. Hope we can meet in person uh, after this lockdown and... Yeah, definitely, mate. You know, maybe do some talks together or something and just, just keep putting it out there. And I'd love to, Chris. I've got a mate who lives near you. I'm not sure where. Um, he's still in Navy now. He's done 40 years. Uh, he's land-based, but he's, uh, he's somewhere between Plymouth and what's the other big place? Portsmouth. He's, he's somewhere uh, in between, I think. Yeah, well, we've, it's it's like Plymouth, Exeter. You've got your sort of Taunton. 
He's down that way. He doesn't yeah. talk funny like you, but he, he drinks cider a lot and shit like that, so... Wait till my wait till my girlfriend is. You said I talk funny. She's never gonna let me live that one down. <laughs> Definitely, mate. Definitely. <laughs> right. Let's let's just give your book a mention. So it's is it Strange Ways of Prison Officer's Story? Yeah, that's it. Strange Ways Prison Officer's Story. Neil Samworth. Uh, it's available worldwide on Amazon. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. I think oh. in a minute it's ninety nine p on Kindle. And free on audio book, so it's got to be a bargain on Kindle, and it ninety nine p. It's just that thing, isn't it? That it's worth way more than that. But sadly, since the you know the invent of Amazon and the ability for yeah. everybody to put free books out there, it it it's um it always change the market. You know, change is inevitable, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do, you, do you like, the last question, do you like a book physically to read? Oh, of course. Drop me your address after, I'll send you a signed copy. I've only got paperbacks, but, you know. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, and, I'll, and do vice, vice versa. That would be great. Thank you. That's Sweet. Yeah, fun. definitely, mate. Yes. Okay, Sammy, thanks ever so much. Let's speak again soon. Um, Wish you all your best. You're doing a good job, mate. Yeah, well, I... I I'm just doing my best and I'm just enjoying being me and enjoying life and uh, what what else is there? Is <laughs> exactly. Exactly, yes. mate. Happy thank to talk anytime. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. And to everybody at home, thank you for watching the Bought the T-Shirt podcast. Massive love to you and your loved ones. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and see you all, see you all soon. See you, Sammy. Cheers. See you later, buddy. Cheers, Take care. Guys. Hello friend, I hope this finds you well. My name's Chris Thrall, I'm a former Royal Marines Commando and I fought my way back from chronic trauma and addiction to live, work and travel in 80 countries across all seven continents, achieving all of my dreams and goals along the way. Now I pass my simple system on to other people, but I can only help you if you like and subscribe. So please do so because you get one life and if you live it right, one is enough.